the British had spearheaded the economic boycott against Italy when the Italians had been invited into Ethiopia in 1935, and the British had hoped it would force the world to buy more goods from Britain. But boycotting Italy didn't help England export more because nobody wanted to buy anything the British were making. So the Crown started rearming themselves for a replay of the Opium Wars to force English products upon the world. The rearmament in preparation for some more gunboat diplomacy was also supposed to give the unemployed in England something better to do than listening to communist agitators. With its rigid upper crust, the fever of the communist movement was a genuine and obvious threat in Britain, and air raid drills in England continued to justify the rearmament. As soon as Germany took back the Rhineland, Italy helped the Spanish get rid of their royalty, and under control of the crown, the BBC began broadcasting television regularly with anti-German, pro-British stories. But even this propaganda was unable to make people prefer English goods to the quality of the Made in Germany label. Spain had supported America in the War of American Independence, and had fought the British fleet over Gibraltar, while the rest of Europe banded together at the Congress of Vienna in 1814 to leave the crown alone against the world. And Russia and her neighbors, including Holland, Denmark, and Sweden, had been sick and tired of the English boarding their ships in search of contraband. The first Treaty of Paris, signed in 1783, had ended the American War of Independence, and the Second Treaty of Paris, in 1815, ended Napoleon's great adventure in democracy, and it had been a Prussian maneuver that had won the battle when the British met Napoleon at Waterloo. By the time Napoleon was finally defeated, the English national debt had reached 860 million pounds sterling, and the Second Treaty of Paris said that France owed England 28 million pounds to pay for the war, but then France joined the Holy Alliance with Russia, Austria, Prussia, and Spain, and Britain refused to sign the Second Treaty of Paris because they doubted the French could be forced to pay reparations with friends like that. The double dealing and duplicity with which the British had used Napoleon to weaken the Europeans, had left Britain alone in 1815 without a single remaining friend. And after the First Treaty of Paris, the British had refused to help keep the Moslem pirates from North Africa at bay. The Moslems attacked American ships and held their crews for ransom until the Americans came up with a million dollars to buy back the enslaved sailors in 1795. And that much money was 17% of the yearly budget of the United States, but did little to nothing to deter the Moslem pirates, so Thomas Jefferson obtained a copy of the Koran in hopes of getting an edge on the problem. After reading it, Jefferson established the United States Navy on the 30th of April in 1798 that was called the Department of the Navy, or D.O.N. Don, in order to speak to the Moslems in the only language they knew, a dialogue that began on the shores of Tripoli in the First Barbary War. As soon as Jefferson became president in 1801, the U.S. Navy sent gunboats to the Mediterranean, to join with the Swedes who'd been fighting the Moslems, and the Sicilians offered three ports for the Americans to use, and after the D.O.N. Don prevailed, a treaty was signed giving $60,000 to the Moslem leaders as a bribe to keep their fellow travelers under control. The man who made that deal stayed in Tripoli for seven years until the War of 1812 broke out and then he came back to America and committed suicide four years later, but it could have been murder. After taking care of the War of 1812, in which the British enticed some Indians to attack Americans, the Second Barbary War ended with the victorious U.S. Navy, ending the threat of Moslem pirates for good. 
and the D.O.N. Don freed over 1,700 English slaves who were being held captive in North Africa. When Rommel hit the beaches of North Africa in 1941, the British were in Egypt trying to counter the Italians, who really just wanted to be friends with Britain, and the Italians had been attacked in December of 1940 and had been losing ground to the British until Rommel came to North Africa in February, 90 days later. The British were right in the middle of their Operation Compass that was supposed to put an end to the Italians in North Africa and also chase them away from the Suez Canal. And Rommel interfered with Churchill's plans for Compass that would end with an Axis victory in June of 1941. Rommel had attacked the British on the 24th of March, rather than holding the line as he'd been ordered, and the British had been surprised when Rommel attacked because they knew from their ultra-intercepts that Rommel was under direct orders to stay put, and that Hitler had sent him merely as a show of moral support to the Italians. From the 10th of April in 1941, and for the following seven months, Rommel held Tobruk under siege, and Rommel took Benghazi, which made the Italians furious because they knew that Rommel was operating against orders. And when a telegram arrived from Berlin supporting the Italians, their commander couldn't speak German, and Rommel rode right over his objections by pretending the telegram from Hitler upheld Rommel's actions. Hitler sent Friedrich Paulus to brief Rommel two weeks later on the 25th of April and to order him to halt the attack on Tobruk that Rommel was planning for the 30th of April. But Rommel did it anyway, and Paulus ordered him on the 4th of May to stop attacking the British altogether. Rommel was told that he would not be receiving fuel or ammo or food or water because Hitler was preparing to invade Russia and on the 10th of May in 1941, exactly one year after Hitler had marched into France, Rudolf Hess flew his private Messerschmitt over to England to see the Scottish Duke of Hamilton and to negotiate a peace, hoping to save Germany from having to go through with Barbarossa. Hess had been expected, and the coastal radi radar batteries had been turned off to let him in. Hess had been expected, and the coastal radar batteries had been turned off to let him in, and Hess was the number three Nazi after Hitler and Goering, and his title was the Deputy Führer. And Hess insisted on being taken to see the Duke of Hamilton for a meeting he claimed had been arranged earlier in Lisbon. Some historians said that Hess landed his plane safely while the British newspapers reported that he'd run out of gas and crashed. And the British said the radar grid had been temporarily shut down for repairs when Hess parachuted unarmed into Britain after flying right through the radar screen on the coast. And that same day on the 10th of May in 1941, the RAF wiped out the Iraqi Air Force. Hess had met the Duke of Hamilton's son Douglas in Germany during the Olympic Games in 1936, and they had attended many of the same dinner parties, and Douglas Hamilton had been the first man to fly over Mount Everest in 1933 and had flown his own plane over to see the Olympic Games where he'd been given an extensive tour of the Luftwaffe. When his father died in 1940, the Duke of Hamilton's son Douglas became the Duke of Hamilton, and he was in charge of the coastal radar defense in the sector where Hess flew through to meet him in 1941. Hess was put in the hospital because upon landing he had injured his foot, and after visiting Hess in the hospital, the Duke of Hamilton went off to see Churchill at Ditchley. And then he went with Churchill to London to talk with the War Cabinet, where the Duke of Hamilton was told that Churchill needed Germany to destroy Russia before any peace with Hitler could be made, and the Duke was told to disavow any knowledge of Rudolf Hess. Immediately, Hess was sent to the Tower of London, 
and the Royal Navy sunk the Bismarck two weeks later on the 27th of May. Hess had politely asked a farmer and his wife to call the police so he could contact the Duke, and it had been the gesture of a nobleman, not of a commoner, and on the 4th of June, the week after sinking the Bismarck, the ex-Kaiser Wilhelm died in Holland. The Italians and the Germans in North Africa attacked the British two weeks later on the 15th of June destroying one hundred of their tanks while Rommel lost only a dozen. And Hitler sent Kesselring to North Africa, where he would outrank the Italian commander Gambara, who was Rommel's superior. That week on the 22nd of June, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa into Russia, and Rommel was called back to Germany in July to get yelled at by Hitler. Rommel returned in August after FDR had ordered Churchill to sail over on the HMS Prince of Wales in the first week of August in 1941 to meet in Newfoundland for the Riviera Conference, where FDR personally asked Churchill what the British were up to in the Mediterranean and why the Duke of Hamilton's peace offer had been spurned. FDR told Churchill at Riviera in Newfoundland, that America had been sending Lend-Lease supplies to Russia since the beginning of June, and FDR made a deal with Churchill that included the purchase of the new American M3 tanks. Rommel was planning an attack on the British in North Africa for the 15th of November to seize a British airfield, but Hitler ordered him to call it off, and Stalin began his Russian counteroffensive two weeks later, on the 5th of December of 1941, when the temperature around Moscow had dropped to 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Stalin was heartened that America was willing to help, not just because FDR knew that conquering Russia was a British plot to expand their empire, but because if Stalin was defeated, it would be well-nigh impossible to check Hitler, especially if Britain and Germany came to terms. And Barbarossa ground to a complete halt after five months, right before Christmas in 1941, allowing the Russians to finally counterattack in force. In North Africa, the British had launched Operation Flipper on the 18th of November to assassinate Rommel, and the secondary target was the 101st Italian Trieste Division, led by General Gambara. But Rommel wasn't even at his headquarters when the British commandos arrived, because Rommel was in Rome. For Flipper, the British sent two squads of 25 men each on board two submarines, and the squads were supposed to seize a radio station at Apollonia and occupy the Italian headquarters at Serena with its communications mast. But instead the British assassins would spend 40 days wandering in the desert. Some of them did capture the Italian radio station, but the main mission to murder all but the main mission to murder Rommel sort of falls apart on closer inspection because if the British were intercepting all German radio traffic in 1941 with their ultra program, they would have known that Rommel was in Rome and not in North Africa. Historians said that the British did not disclose this information to the flipper commandos in order to protect the secrecy of the ultra intercepts. But the known facts are that the two squads were landed on the beach from the two submarines on the night before the 15th of November, and after failing to kill Rommel, they ran into Italy's Trieste division on their way back to the beach, and they were purported to have surrendered to the Italians, while others in the squads had dispersed and become lost in the desert for the next 37 days. Flipper was one facet of Operation Crusader that had gone off the same day as the flipper beaching on the 18th of November. And during Crusader, General Gambaro was allowed into Tobruk as the British retreated. 
Crusader ended in a draw due to supply problems of food and water suffered by both sides. But things would improve for the British after delivery of the new American M3 tanks that ran dependably in the desert, while the British tanks decidedly had not. The British attack on the 18th of November lost them 530 tanks within the first four days, compared to Rommel losing 100 tanks. And the Italians knocked out another 350 British tanks, and when the British 30 Corps with its 3,500 men and 700 vehicles was heading back to Egypt on the 2nd of December in 1941, Rommel turned around to chase them, but it would be the last of his run of easy victories because Hitler was refusing to send him any more food or fuel. Rommel had attacked the British near the Egyptian border on the 24th of November and just missed a major British supply dump by only four miles, and it was at this point that Rommel completely ran out of supplies and was commanded to return to Tobruk to wait for further orders, putting him right back where he had started in March. Crusader ended on the 30th of December in 1941 and was supposed to have been a British victory, leaving them the masters of the Mediterranean. And in winning Crusader, Churchill could have cut a deal with Hitler and ended the war by Christmas. The attack on Pearl Harbor would have kept America from having any say in the peace negotiations, but the, Brit but the Russians had turned the tide against the Germans at the Battle of Moscow, and a separate peace eluded Churchill's grasp that holiday season, because not only had the Russians begun their long, steady counteroffensive towards Berlin, the Americans had shrugged off the attack on Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese had succeeded only in awakening a sleeping giant. The war would go on for another year before Churchill could again reach for a negotiated peace, but it would have to be after the Russians were defeated, and that required convincing the Americans to turn against Russia. The Germans had lost a million men on the vast Russian prairies, and the Italians were proving to be better fighters than anyone had thought possible, so 1942 would be a series of skirmishes and stalemates while war plans were being revised. The Axis powers retained air and naval superiority in the Mediterranean until after the Americans landed in North Africa in November of 1942 for Operation Torch, named after the passing of the baton in the Olympic Games because the Americans fully understood that their only choice now was to achieve victory over both belligerents, the Germans as well as the British. Thus the torch was passed to America, and had Rommel not obeyed his own battle instincts rather than Hitler's specific orders, the war might have ended with Crusader in December of 1941. But because of Rommel's insubordination, Hitler's war would go on for another three and a half years, and the day after the British had launched Crusader, Hitler had appointed himself the direct and upfront supreme commander of all the German armies on the 19th of December in 1941, and that granted him the sole ability to personally negotiate with, Hit with Churchill without any interference from any of his disobedient German generals. America had been sending trucks and food and motorcycles and guns and tools and telephone lines to the Russians, and the war had now taken on a life of its own, and while the British were busy trying to keep Russia from being supplied by America, fifty new tanks with supplies got through to Rommel past the British blockade in January of 1942, and he attacked the following day on the 21st of January, destroying 100 British tanks, and Rommel took back Benghazi on the 29th of January. The British would continue to lose to Rommel in the first six months of 1942 and Rommel was being helped by an American official in Egypt named Bonner Fellers, who was sending details about British intentions and capabilities directly to Rommel because 
Pearl Harbor had just been attacked and FDR gave direct orders to Bonner Fellers to help Rommel, and this flow of information would go on for the next six months. Should the British find out where Rommel was getting his information, the Americans were told to say that the Germans had intercepted the undercoded messages from Egypt. Rommel attacked the British on the 26th of May in 1942 using airplane engines mounted on trucks to kick up dust and make it appear he had a much larger force. And the day after that battle, Heydrich was assassinated in Czechoslovakia, and three days later the British bombed Cologne on the 30th of May in their first use of the quote-unquote streamer tactic that they called a thousand bomber raid and two-thirds of the bombs were incendiaries. Rommel forced the British back towards Egypt two weeks later on the 14th of June, and he seized Tobruk on the 20th of June, and the British 8th Army surrendered 35,000 POWs along with all the British supplies. FDR called Churchill the following day and told him to show up in December for the Arcadia Conference, and that meant Churchill had to travel over to America again that Christmas season at the end of 1942 to explain to FDR what the British were doing. The day after the British Eighth Army had surrendered to Rommel in Tobruk on the 22nd of June, highlighting the launch of Barbarossa, Hitler had no choice but to promote Rommel to general field marshal, not simply to please Rommel's fans back home, but because he now needed Rommel to stop the Americans who were on their way to North Africa for Operation Torch to put the British out of business. One week after FDR ordered the British to show up for Arcadia, the British complained on the 29th of June that their loss at Tobruk was the fault of the Americans, claiming that the Germans had been able to read all the British radio codes and that the Americans in Egypt were to blame. Rommel's attack on the 28th of June had been in direct defiance of Hitler's orders, and the British lost another 6,000 soldiers and 40 tanks while Rommel gained more fuel and supplies, along with hundreds of British tanks and trucks, and then what was left of the British army withdrew to El Alamein. Hitler had completely cut Rommel off, while the British were somehow in possession of detailed information about every German shipment being sent to Rommel as well as all his troop movements, and the British claimed they'd been decoding German messages rather than having been informed directly from Berlin by telephone. The Italians were also diverting Rommel's supplies into the black mar market. And when Rommel attacked at El Alamein in July of 1942, the Luftwaffe stayed away while Rommel was bombed by the RAF, and Rommel lost his Signals Intercept Company 621 at El Alamein on the 11th of July that had been supplying him with priceless intelligence from British radio communications. Churchill stopped off in Cairo in August on his way to see Stalin, and Churchill appointed Bernard Law Montgomery to lead the British Army in North Africa, and from then on things went badly for Rommel, with Hitler purposely starving him and Rommel continuing, continuing to act on his own rather than following Hitler's orders. Unbeknownst to Rommel, he was screwing up Churchill's strategic plan to make a separate peace with Hitler before the Americans could get into the fight, and the real wrench in the works was the cold reality that the Germans had failed to beat the Russians during Operation Barbarossa. After Monty arrived in North Africa to take over the British Eighth Army, Rommel found out that a British convoy with over 100,000 tons of supplies was due to arrive in September, so he planned an attack at El Alamein on the 30th of August before the shipment could arrive, and Rommel had obtained a map of all the British minefields from a dead English officer, officer in a jeep.
While the British claimed they'd intentionally planted the maps on a corpse so the Germans would go around the minefields and get bogged down in the soft sand, but Rommel used the map to negotiate the minefield anyway, and yet his attack would fail for lack of fuel. The Russians were beating the Germans at Stalingrad, and after the Americans made themselves comfortable in North Africa in November of 1942, FDR ordered Churchill to show up at Casablanca in January of 1943 to hear the news from FDR that there would be no separate peace without including the Russians. FDR chose to hold the Casablanca conference in French Morocco so the French so that France could be well represented and in response to the Americans refusal to engage in peace negotiations with Hitler the Germans at Tripoli surrendered to the British and were completely out of North Africa by the 14th of May in 1943 and two days after that the RAF bombed Rome a quarter of a million Axis soldiers surrendered to the British in North Africa that May, and the next month the British began bombing Germany in June of 1943, and on the 24th of July the RAF firebombed Hamburg, killing 40,000 civilians, but Hitler could not make peace with Churchill because the Americans refused to go along, and that's when the Americans' Operation Roundup turned into the British Operation Overlord, a scheme to show the Americans once and for all what war planning was all about. For Hitler, this wasn't just about overthrowing the Treaty of Versailles or getting German land in Poland back or even having the port of Danzig return to the fatherland. And it wasn't about the Czechs and the Austrians and the Rhinelanders joined to their German brothers in some kind of Nordic solidarity. This was about ultimate fusion with their Germanic cousins in Great Britain that would forever erase the crime of having toppled the Tsar just because Russia had sided with France in 1914 and wasn't it always about the French? The British wanted to return the exiled Russian nobility to their rightful place within an even stronger British Empire, and to overturn Hitler's call to the common man by elevating him to a more noble status than restoring the royal line of nobility in Germany. The Kaiser had still been alive when the British planners were working on Operation Crusader in 1941, and although he was 82 years old, the Kaiser had almost two dozen offspring ready to step up into his place, and it was well known that from his exile in Holland the Kaiser had refused to ever return to Germany until a successful restoration of the monarchy had taken place. Crusader was meant to put an end to the Italians who had occupied Tobruk for the past thirty years, and the Italians had been there ever since they had once ruled the entire Mediterranean for centuries as the Roman Empire. And Italy's king, Victor Emmanuel III, had handed over power to Mussolini when the black shirts marched on Rome in 1922 and King Victor Emmanuel III was still waiting in the wings, and he was also the King of Albania and King of Ethiopia, and he had a son named Umberto, to whom he would transfer authority on the 10th of April in 1944. Of all the monarchs of Europe waiting to be restored to their thrones, Britain's most favorite was Peter II of Yugoslavia, whose godfather was the current King of England. And when the war finally ended, Umberto was King of Italy for 34 days until the monarchy itself was abolished on the 12th of June in 1945, and all male heirs to the throne were forbidden from ever setting foot on Italian soil again. Rommel was not a member of the Nazi party, 
and Rommel had asked Hitler for permission to promote Jews serving in his army in North Africa to show the world that Hitler was not mistreating Jews. And Rommel ordered that his white POWs share the same quarters as the colored POWs. And that was when his supplies began to dry up. Monty had been in a good position at El Alamein to cut off Rommel's retreat. But Monty had given orders that the Germans should be allowed to retreat freely because they would be needed to stop the Americans who were at that moment on their way to Tunisia. At El Alamein, Rommel lost 50 tanks and 3,000 men, but suffered most from lack of Luftwaffe support and then Rommel was once more ordered back to Germany to get yelled at by Hitler, and the British attacked on the 23rd of October by sending the Canadians forward in a suicide attack. Two days later, Rommel came back from Germany on the 25th of October, but had only 150 tanks to Monty's 800, most of them Shermans and Hitler ordered Rommel to hold his position to the last man, but Rommel disobeyed again, and Kesselring took Rommel's side. On the 3rd of November, the British sent the Indians from India forward in another suicide attack, and Rommel retreated from El Alamein the next day on the 4th of November, and would say later that his biggest regret was not retreating sooner before he was left with only 30 tanks and no Luftwaffe support, but said that he'd been required to wait for permission from Hitler to retreat. Rommel was lucky that rainstorms had grounded the British air forces that last week, or the disobedient Rommel would have been annihilated in North Africa, and the Americans hit the beach four days later, on the 8th of November, in 1942, the first U.S. boots on the ground in Hitler's war. The Americans were led by George Smith Patton, Jr., and Patton had been born on the 11th of November in 1885, the same year the Statue of Liberty arrived in New York Harbor from France and the Statue of Liberty was dedicated with the first-ever ticker tape parade on the 28th of October in New York City. It would become obvious on day one of Operation Torch that the British could not control the Americans, but not for want of trying, and Churchill had hoped that the threat of America coming into the war would have compelled Hitler to quickly make terms, and when the Americans did make it ashore in North Africa, Churchill desperately needed Hitler's help to stop the Americans, but within a year it would be found out that even with the best clandestine assistance from the British, the Third Reich would not be able to stop the Americans either. When the British reported that Rommel had withdrawn from El Alamein on the 11th of November on Patton's birthday in 1942, Stalin launched his Russian counteroffensive towards Stalingrad the following week on the 19th of November, trapping the Germans four days later in a complete pincer encirclement. And the Germans at Stalingrad would surrender on the 31st of January in 1943 after an airlift was attempted for 70 days to rescue Paulus, but had failed for lack of fuel, even though the Luftwaffe had enough transport planes to have gotten the job done. Kesselring was the Luftwaffe field marshal in North Africa, and had been terribly disappointed to see his airstrips being lost to the British, and he'd been short on planes and fuel while the British gained air superiority in North Africa. And after El Alamein, Rommel was ordered to Tunisia where he was shocked to see such a large buildup of German forces being prepared to fight the Americans. The supplies that had been denied to Rommel at El Alamein were now given to him so he could lead the attack on the Americans at Kasserine Pass. But it was to be Rommel's last victory in Hitler's war, and command of North Africa was given back to the Italians as soon as the Americans appeared to be defeated at Kasserine Pass in February, and Rommel was ordered to remain there as subordinate to the Italians.
When Rommel attacked the British on the 6th of March in 1943, Monty had been aware of all Rommel's plans in advance, and Rommel was ambushed and lost 50 tanks and was ordered back to Germany on the 9th of March for a debriefing with Hitler, and then Rommel's men would surrender in May into the care of the British in North Africa. Rommel was sent to Greece in July of 1943 to keep out the Russians, but was ordered back to Berlin that same day because Mussolini had been ousted, and Rommel was now to go to Italy on the 16th of August, but the Italians made peace with the Americans instead on the 8th of September, so Rommel was put in charge of taking all the Italians' guns away. Kesselring and Rommel were ordered to Berlin on the 30th of September, where Kesselring told Hitler that the Germans could hold a line to the south of Rome, while Rommel said they could hold a line north of Rome. But Hitler was interested in finding the Pope's gold, so Hitler made Kesselring the commander in Italy and sent Rommel to France to get ready to stop the Americans in the British Operation Overlord the following spring. When Omar Nelson Bradley arrived in London to prepare for Overlord, there were already twenty divisions of American soldiers camped out in England. And when Bradley tried to check into a hotel, he was told he was not welcome. And when Bradley set up his headquarters in an old school in London, the British rang the city's church bells for the first time since 1940, the bells used to signal that the English beaches had been invaded by the enemy. The British told Bradley that they were just ringing the bells to celebrate a British victory in Sicily, and Bradley had just come fresh from the Sicilian campaign, where he'd gotten so fed up with British bombing raids missing their targets in Sicily at the expense of Americans that on the 5th of August in 1943, Bradley had had the Americans drop their ordnance squarely on Monty's headquarters. After that, Bradley had the Americans set 33,000 Sicilian POWs free to go home to their families because it was harvest time and the grain and grape crops required working men, and 20% of the American soldiers had been Italians themselves. The British were unhappy when Bradley brought his own staff to London instead of using British advisers. But Bradley ignored their dismay because he'd been a boilermaker before attending West Point, and after setting up his headquarters in England, Bradley flew back to America to personally pick out the officers he would need for his staff during Overlord. While in America, Bradley went to Omaha with General George Marshall, who was speaking at an American Legion convention, and FDR asked Bradley to stop in to say hello. Marshall had fought in the Great War, and his roommate on the ship over to France had been Leslie James McNair, and FDR told Bradley all about the Manhattan Project and warned him that the Germans might drop an atom bomb on the Americans at any time after D-Day. After those two weeks of vacation, Bradley headed back to England, but before leaving, he went with his wife to New York City to see the musical Oklahoma on Broadway. Bradley asked Monty if the British would please supply one 17-pounder anti-tank gun for each U.S. tank platoon, and Monty said that British supply was overloaded with British orders and Bradley asked Monty to give the Americans just a few 17-pounders they could tow, and Monty said they were in too short supply to spare, so Bradley had the Americans bring in several battalions of 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns that could be pointed down to the ground towards the enemy tanks, and the Americans told Monty that they were difficult to maneuver and were needed as a defensive weapon against German panzers while London was being buzz-bombed with V-1s. The relationship never improved between the British and American officers, although Dwight David Eisenhower made a superhuman effort to make that happen. 
and Ike's biggest problem would not be the supplies or the weather or the Russians making a separate peace with Hitler, but was the constant threat of the British making a separate peace with Germany. And that would have left the American soldiers stranded in a foreign land whose language they did not speak, completely outnumbered by a thoroughly competent and implacable enemy. On D-Day at 6.45 a.m., the German radio reported that the British had landed and had made it almost all the way to the city of Caen and that the Americans had been smashed at Omaha Beach, and at 1.35 p.m. the German radio said that the Americans had been thrown back into the sea, and when confronted with reports to the contrary, Monty's radio room allowed Ike's messages to get through again. By 6 p.m., Rommel reported that the British reports were false, and that the Americans were coming ashore in strength, and Rommel ordered every German in France under his command to move towards the American beaches while Monty carefully separated his British troops from the Americans. The landing craft, carrying the Americans toward Utah Beach, had caught a current that took them 2,000 yards south of their landing zone, where there were fewer Germans waiting for them, so Utah Beach suffered less than 200 casualties, and they were able to go inland four miles and make contact with the American 101st Airborne. Only 10% of the 101st paratroopers had been dropped in their intended zones, which mightily confused the Germans who were unprepared to see so many Americans arrive where they were not supposed to be. On Omaha Beach, most of the naval bombardment had missed the Germans dug in on the heights who were waiting there to attack them, and by noon, when the enemy began to run out of ammunition, the Americans were able to move forward off the beaches. The British were landing on Gold Beach and had been offloaded directly onto shore or close to shore, rather than further out as the Americans had been forced to do, and the British made contact with the Canadians who were landing on Juneau Beach and had suffered 1,000 casualties in disembarking, and by nightfall the Gold and Juneau beachheads were 12 miles wide and 7 miles deep. Much of the opening artillery on D-Day had either been off-target or not concentrated enough to have had any impact against the Germans, and the specialized armor providing artillery support worked on the British beaches but not on Omaha. The British on Sword Beach went safely inland to within a few miles of Caen for their Operation Perch and it would take until the 13th of June for the confusion of Perch to die down after over 4,000 men had died on the Normandy beaches with 10,000 of them wounded and at the same time the Germans lost 1,000 men. The Americans laid huge steel mats on the sand for traction while flotsam still washed up on the beach with every tide and the American brass sat on the beach eating sea rations and biscuits while they discussed the war. No Germans had counterattacked yet, but twice some German tanks had approached Monty's command post, but no shots were fired. The plan for Overlord gave Monty complete command and control over all the ground forces in the Normandy theater, while Ike back in London was the supreme commander, and that meant the Americans would be under Monty's command until the agreed-upon date of the 1st of September, when the American soldiers would revert to an American commander rather than having Monty issuing orders. With this structure, Ike was not quite in command as the supreme commander because he had to answer to an allied command board in Britain called Schaefe, and until the 1st of September, Monty was given authority over all the American troops, as long as he pretended to have interpreted Ike's wishes correctly, which began as a bad situation that would quickly get worse. During the planning of Overlord, Monty described a 90-day battle where the Americans 
would clear France in a counterclockwise motion until reaching Monty's flank at Cannes, at which time the Americans would cover his march to the Seine River and the Germans would sue for peace because Hitler would be dead. Rommel's 21st Panzer Division had advanced towards Monty on the afternoon of D-Day before being ordered back east of Caen, and the British went 20 miles inland west of Caen, and Monty C.P. was only 10 miles inland. The British were stretched out along an eight-mile front, so Bradley sent some American tanks over to fill the holes in Monty's front, and on the evening of the 12th of June, Bradley was sent a message from Monty that the Germans were planning to attack Carrington in the morning, and that he should take back his tanks. The next day, Monty called for a meeting, but Bradley said he couldn't show because Ike and Marshall had come over from England and the V-1 buzz-bomb rockets started falling on London that afternoon. In the morning, the Germans came forward and the Americans pushed them back, and the commander of the American sector next to the British came over and showed Bradley how open Monty's rear was, saying that the Germans could come right through and cut off the Americans from their supply lines, so Bradley sent the American tanks back to keep an eye on Monty and then Bradley started receiving reports of supply problems. Thursday, March 23, 1944 A few days ago Ike received a personal message from General Clayton Bissell, the new War Department G-2, saying that a package containing important documents concerning Overlord had been intercepted in Chicago. It had been sent from our Ordnance Division G-4 and erroneously addressed to a private residence in a section of Chicago heavily populated by Germans. The package was poorly wrapped and, according to General Bissell, a casual perusal of the papers was made by four unauthorized persons in the headquarters of the Army's Sixth Service Command in Chicago, in addition to at least ten persons in the Chicago Post Office. It now appears that the package was addressed by an American soldier who is of German extraction. He states that his sister, who lives in Chicago, who lives at the Chicago address, had been seriously ill and thinks he simply erred in writing the address on the package because his mind was preoccupied with thoughts of home. Thus he wrote on the package his sister's home address rather than the proper address in the War Department in Washington. The clumsy handling would indicate that no professional spy was involved, but nevertheless important facts, including strength, places, equipment, and tentative target date, have been disclosed to unauthorized persons. Just another worry for the Supreme Commander. My three years with Eisenhower, the personal diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, USNR Naval Aid to General Eisenhower, 1942 to 1945, by Harry Butcher, New York, Simon and Schuster, 1946, page 505. The front page of this book has a picture of Ike with a signed note in his handwriting, to Butch, in memory of the three years we spent together in the war against the European Axis, with warm regard, Dwight D. Eisenhower. On D-Day. The Americans had 32 tanks ready to roll onto the beach that were to be launched with flotation devices designed by Britain, and all but five of the tanks prepared by the British had their flotation devices improperly installed, and those sorely needed 27 tanks had immediately sunk before reaching the beaches. As the Americans hit the shore 55 minutes after the Royal Navy ships had opened fire well above the coastal defenses, there had still not been a shot fired from the Germans towards the boats at sea. Instead, the Germans dropped hand grenades on the Americans who were using elaborate cliff-scaling mechanisms de developed by the British, and 200 American rangers, led by a commander from Texas, were eliminated. 
an American destroyer came to their rescue and fired on the Germans, who did not return fire, but retreated with their big guns to an apple orchard three hundred yards inland, and these German guns had a range of twenty thousand yards and could have destroyed the incoming fleet, but instead it was discovered when they were finally captured that they had been sighted on the American beaches instead of on the ships at sea. By the end of June, Monty had sixteen divisions in Normandy while the Americans had eleven, and Hitler had been assured that the mongrel Americans were not a large presence and that they were well under Monty's control. And on the 17th of June, Hitler had traveled to Margival, where a V-1 rocket struck near the building where he was meeting with his generals. The Battle of Waterloo had been fought on the 18th of June in Belgium in 1815 and had ended Napoleon's democratic crusade and while Napoleon's French army had beaten the Prussians at Wavre that day, Napoleon himself surrendered at Waterloo that was a mere ten miles away from Brussels. So when British newspapers and the BBC radio were reporting that Monty was on his way to Brussels, all the English knew exactly what that meant. When the Americans got to Brussels first and spoiled the plan, Monty threatened to bomb them along with the retreating Germans, and Bradley gave a news conference that evening on the 18th of June to tell the folks back home that the Americans had suffered far fewer casualties than expected, and Monty hollered that Bradley was giving away troop strength. Late in the morning of the 18th of June, the French attacked. Napoleon promised his staff they would sleep that night in Brussels. Fierce cannonades were launched upon the Allied posts. The battle swayed backwards and forwards upon the grass slopes. In the early afternoon the Prussians had been distantly sighted upon the roads, and desperate fighting with no quarter raged, but again the fury of British infantry fire held them. The long-awaited moment to counterattack had come. Wellington had been in the forefront of danger all day. On his chestnut Copenhagen he had galloped everywhere, issuing brusque orders, gruffly encouraging his men. Now he rode along his much-battered line and ordered the advance. Go on, go on, he shouted, they will not stand. His cavalry swept from the ridge and sabred the French army into a disorganized mass of stragglers. Nia, beside himself with rage, a broken sword in his hand, staggered shouting in vain from one band to another. It was too late. Wellington handed over the pursuit to the Prussians. In agony of soul, Napoleon followed the road back to Paris. Napoleon had reached his capital three days after the battle. On June 22nd, he abdicated and retired. A History of the English-Speaking Peoples, Volume 3, The Age of Revolution, by Winston S. Churchill, New York, Dodd, Mead and Company, 1957, page 377 through 80. Hitler was supposed to travel on the 19th of June to a castle in the La roche guyon area that was Rommel's headquarters, a castle built over the Seine River, fifty miles away from Margival where the V-1 rocket had just missed Hitler. But instead, Hitler left for Berchtesgaden without visiting Rommel's castle headquarters, and Hitler called a meeting at Berchtesgaden on the 28th of June, where he started replacing generals, starting with Rommel, who, was f who had fired on the British on the 13th instead of obeying Hitler's order to stand down. Sunday, June 18, 1944. Today Ike sent a letter to General Montgomery advising against permitting so many visitors to take up his time in these crucial days. Later today he received a letter in longhand from Monty from his tactical headquarters asking for Ike's help to keep visitors away, especially for the next two weeks. My three years with Eisenhower, the personal diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, page 585. 
France had surrendered to Hitler in 1940 on the same date that Napoleon had abdicated in 1815 on the 22nd of June, and the same day when the English had forced themselves onto the beaches of Dunkirk and Calais in 1340 at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, where they had tried to make the English King Edward III also the King of France. Military historians said that if the French at Wavre had marched to help Napoleon at Waterloo, the war could have been won by democratic revolutionary France instead of by the old royal powers. Thursday, June twenty second, 1944 Monty's attack, scheduled for this morning, has not been started, largely because of the delay caused by the weather. However, General Bradley was to have kicked off a good attack at dawn at the base of the Cherbourg Peninsula, parenthesis, it was postponed, close parenthesis, even while Collins's seven corps assaults Cherbourg itself. There were plenty of flying bombs last night. A summary of the week's reception shows that 95% of all these bombs have fallen within 12 miles of Stratum, Stratham five and a half miles southwest of Telegraph Cottage. The headquarters itself are well within this unpleasant boundary. My Three Years with Eisenhower, the personal diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, page 590. Tuesday, June 27, 1944. Monty's attack started on Sunday morning, the 25th, but so far we have had little concrete intimation about it. He waited so long that at least two additional Panzer divisions face him. In addition, the ten or twelve day delay gave the Germans an opportunity to dig in and get set, whereas Bradley kept his fellows moving and the Germans never had much chance to dig in. My Three Years with Eisenhower, the personal diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, page 593 and 4. Von Rundstedt had ordered an attack on the British near Caen on the 10th of June, but Hitler had cancelled the order and had taken Rommel's first SS Panzer away from him on the 7th of June and given it to von Schweppenberg. Rommel's Panzer Lair Division had been dive-bombed by the British when he came to stop the invasion on the British beaches on D-Day, and it had been Rommel's soldiers who were attacking Monty during Perch. And on the 11th of June, when the British took control of the central crossroads, they were attacked several times by Rommel, and Hitler ordered Rommel south to face the Americans instead. And when Rommel failed to move quickly enough, he suffered a severe naval bombardment from the British. Monty sent out his special unit, the Desert Rats, on the 13th of June to a line just outside the city of Khan where four Tiger tanks were waiting for him, but no forward movement was made. And the castle at La roche Guion on the Seine River had been a three-hour train ride away from Caen, and after the 22nd of June, Monty would sit in his CP outside Caen for the next 68 days. Monty had told the American commanders to show up for a meeting on the 9th of June, and ordered them to march toward the port of Cherbourg through St. Lo. And then he flew back to London that afternoon, and when the Americans marched toward St. Lo, they were hit on both flanks as though the Germans were told in advance when and where they were headed and exactly how many of them there would be. When Monty had ordered the Americans to seize St. Lo, Ike had turned him down because St. Lo was one of Charlemagne's old citadels, and Ike and Bradley refused to waste American lives on a prestige target and instead they wanted to focus on getting Cherbourg in operation as an American supply line. Due to Rommel's insubordination, Monty had been able to move Monty had not been able to move into the territory he was supposed to occupy. Due to Rommel's insubordination, 
Monty had not been able to move into the territory he was supposed to occupy, and the British had taken severe casualties until Hitler had ordered the Germans back on the evening of the 12th of June, and Monty ended Perch on the 13th of June, after losing 6,000 men, while Rommel lost 3,000, and then Hitler ordered Rommel to withdraw to Sinlo to wait for the Americans. When the 352nd left for Sinlo, they'd been the only Germans left in the zone Monty would occupy until the 1st of September, except for one German reconnaissance battalion belonging to von Funk, and these were moved to the north side of Caen while Sepp Dietrich was sent to keep an eye on Rommel's troops. Monty told the British to stand down after advancing unopposed for twelve miles into the area left by the 352nd, the last half of the march supposedly through an area still held by the Germans. Rommel's 352nd Division was originally stationed at St. Lo, but they'd been moved up to Omaha Beach two weeks before D-Day, and while the British knew this, they did not relay that information to the Americans, and the Big Red One came on anyway. Rommel had been given leave to go to his home in Germany on the 4th of June, and two days later the British naval guns fired on D-Day well beyond his 352nd into the French countryside, and having carefully studied the terrain... The British knew that the Americans had only one road and three footpaths at Omaha Beach, but U.S. bulldozers turned those footpaths into roads, even though only six of the sixteen bulldozers from the landing fleet made it ashore, and three of them had immediately been put out of action by German gunfire. Some Americans made it a mile inland by the afternoon of D-Day, and before the sun set, Bradley landed and set up his command post. Across the estuary that slashed into the Contenton Neck, our PT rammed through the surf at full throttle, with two lookouts hugging the deck to warn him of floating mines. The skipper drove his eggshelled craft through blinding spray. Inside the Utah Anchorage, we located the bayfield by its topside antenna. As the PT boat pitched to the crest of a f six foot wave, I jumped for the rope net of the bayfield and clambered up its high steel sides. In contrast to Omaha, where the shadow of catastrophe hung over our heads all day, the landing on Utah had gone more smoothly than during rehearsal five weeks before. A Soldier's Story, Omar N. Bradley, General of the Army, by Omar N. Bradley, New York Popular Library Eagle Books Edition, Holt Reinhardt and Winston, Inc., 1951, page 77. The rehearsal at Slapton Sands, to which Bradley referred, had been an attempt by the Royal Navy to convince the Americans that they should not participate in the overlord invasion but should send their American troops to the Balkans instead. At Slapton Sands for Operation Tiger, commando boats and submarines had murdered several hundred Americans in the middle of the night, while the Royal Navy floated within sight but had not come to their aid, claiming to have been on a different radio channel. The American beach at Omaha was seven miles away from the British beaches, and at 6 a.m. on the 7th of June, Monty radioed to tell Bradley that it was time for the Americans to link up with the British, and Ike was due ashore at 11 a.m., and when he arrived, Ike told Bradley that not a single D-Day radio report had come through to him until late afternoon. "'Golly, Brad!' he exclaimed, grasping me by the hand. "'You had us all scared stiff yesterday morning. "'Why in the devil didn't you let us know what was going on?' "'But we did,' I was puzzled. "'We radioed you every scrap of information we had, "'everything that came in from both G. and Collins.' "'Ike shook his head. "'Nothing came through until late afternoon. "'Not a damned word. "'I didn't know what had happened to you.' 
but your headquarters acknowledged every message as we asked them to. You check it out when you get back, and you'll find they all got through. Aboard the Augusta, twenty minutes later, I double-checked our journals. Not only had the messages been sent, but each had been properly acknowledged. Later I heard that the decoding apparatus had broken down at Montgomery's CP. Bradley, page 282 and 3. When the Americans survived the ambush at Senlo, Rommel was ordered back to Berchtesgaden to explain to Hitler why he'd been shooting at Monty against orders on the 12th of June during Perch, instead of going after the Americans, but that shouldn't have taken a rocket scientist to figure out after North Africa. The Americans started on their final march at 3 a.m. to Cherbourg, while dawn broke raining and blowing and Omaha Beach closed down for a major storm. The artificial harbors called Mulberries had been set up for offloading supplies and ammunition, but the storm destroyed the Americans' mulberries at Omaha, while the one on the British beach withstood the weather and American soldiers pitched in to repair a good deal of their harbor at Omaha Beach, but Monty declared Omaha closed for supplies, and thereafter directed all ships to his landing zone instead. Monty declared that the Americans could resupply themselves just as soon as they captured the port of Cherbourg, and Monty ended the discussion by sending Ike south on a phony story about poison gas being stockpiled by the Germans. After starting towards Cherbourg on the 19th of June, Bradley called off his Cherbourg offensive with only three days of ammo left and rationed his troops to 25 pounds per each per day and Bradley appealed and appealed until the American Air Force C-47s airdropped more ammunition and supplies to Bradley and his men. On the 21st of June, the Americans told the Germans in Cherbourg to surrender or die, and the BBC reported the American threat over the radio waves. But the Germans said they had orders to hold Cherbourg to the bitter end, so Bradley called for an Air Force raid, but the Air RAF came in first, just before noon, and heavily strafed the Americans. The Germans watching this wondered why the Luftwaffe had failed to appear, and they surrendered in disgust when they saw the British strafing the Americans unopposed. The Americans had played Strauss waltzes for the Germans in Cherbourg over loudspeakers and had dropped leaflets telling them to bring their mess kits with them, but the German soldiers said it was the lack of German fighter support that had made them surrender, and when they marched out of Cherbourg, the Germans were clean and shiny, well-fed and well-rested, and they had been deeply bunkered with plenty of ammo, and their surrender on the 26th of June won Rommel an invitation back to Berchtesgaden to be yelled at again by Hitler. By the 30th of June, the Americans held the whole Carrington Peninsula, and it would not be until the end of September that the port of Cherbourg could be used for supply because it had been so badly damaged by the British aerial bombing. In the face of the Americans' success, Rommel would again disobey during Monty's Operation Epsom and cause it to fail and be abandoned on the 30th of June, and Monty would have sole control of supplies in the Normandy Theater until Cherbourg was finally cleared of mines on the 16th of July that would give the Americans some small access to their own supply shipments for a welcome change. Monty's Epsom had been launched on the 26th of June as his tanks headed across the river Oden through German lines, and on the 30th of June, Monty came back because for the first time, von Rundstedt had disobeyed Hitler by letting Rommel attack the British during Epsom, and von Rundstedt was fired the following day on the 1st of July, not because he'd said to Keitel, make peace, you fools, but because he'd been unwilling to restrain Rommel. 
The following week, the RAF dropped 2,000 tons of bombs on the city of Caen for Operation Charnwood on the 8th of July, but they left the German forces outside the city alone, although two German tanks had been destroyed and Charnwood demolished most of the historic old city of Caen, where the Duke of Normandy had lived before he became William the Conqueror. And then came Monty's Operation Green Line on the 15th of July to establish the British area of occupation for the upcoming fight against the Americans. Monty was preparing for Operation Goodwood, when he launched Operation Pomegranate, where a railway station was seized so some VIPs could show up on the 16th of July. And the next day, a Spitfire targeted a German staff car carrying Rommel on the 17th of July, and Monty launched Goodwood the next day on the 18th, as soon as Rommel was presumed dead because the pilot had sworn that he watched the car flip over. Monty held a press conference on the first day of Goodwood, but would tell the press after the operation failed that all his talk about Goodwood had been propaganda to keep the Germans facing him instead of facing the Americans, and Ike found out that Monty had lied after Ike was shown a copy of Monty's orders that kept the British Goodwood attack limited rather than the breakthrough ordered by Ike. Monty had also been ordered to ordered by Ike to attack and capture Falaise, but three days before Goodwood, Monty had changed his copy of the orders to exclude Falaise, and later claimed to have just forgotten to tell Ike about the changes. In Monty's own rewritten orders, he stated that the British needed to remain, quote, a firm bastion, close quote, and Monty included his Operation Atlantic with Goodwood that allowed Monty's troops to seize and hold the high ground above the Americans, which Monty said was intended to, quote, establish a clear border, close quote, between the Allies. When Monty discovered that Rommel had survived the Spitfire strafing on the 17th that was supposed to have killed Rommel the day before Goodwood, the British withdrew from the Orne Bridgehead before dawn on the 18th so that bombers could drop 5,000 tons of high explosives on the village of Cagney, followed by British artillery and more bombers hitting ten other French towns, and because of all the dust and smoke from the bombs, the planes were un unable to properly identify their targets, so some were not bombed, while others not on the list were hit and twenty-five of the bombers were shot down, but they missed the hospital where Rommel was being treated. Wednesday, July 19, 1944. They had heard that we were starting another army group and had seen General McNair. They wondered if McNair's assignment over here was political or what. Assured them Ike had asked for him. As they were even more inquisitive about McNair's job, I didn't say much, but reported to Ike. The next day, Beetle had an off-the-record talk with our small bevy of reporters and told them all about General McNair and his functions. Monty's attack with three armored divisions south and east of Caen got off to a good start yesterday, some seven miles having been gained by noon and the bulk of the enemy's defenses penetrated. The RAF had dropped a concentration of 7,000 tons of bombs to help the ground troops break through the German defense ring. Around evening, Tedder called Ike and said Monty had, in effect, stopped his armor from going farther. Ike was mad. Monty always wants to wait to draw up his quote-unquote administrative tale. Ike has told Monty of his efforts to protect Monty from visitors. Ike having had a long discussion with the PM on the secret phone this morning. Ike had sent word yesterday that the PM could go to Cherbourg and the rear area, but that he was against the Prime Minister visiting commanders or troops in the forward area because they, particularly Monty, did not want to be distracted from the battle. Ike told the PM 
he could motor to Omaha Beach, reboard his ship under Navy care, and sail along the British beaches. But this got misquoted or misinterpreted by the time the PM got it, and this morning the PM called up boiling mad, saying it would be a cabinet issue, this business of Monty trying to tell the PM where he could and could not go. Ike took all the responsibility, and after explaining his desire not to bother Monty, the trip was laid on for tomorrow with the old boy permitted to visit in the rear areas. My Three Years with Eisenhower, The Personal Diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, page 616. Thursday, July 20, 1944. Last evening, about nine, Tedder phoned Ike from Chafe, Maine, and, reflecting the disappointment of the air at the slow, slowness of the ground, said that the British chiefs of staff would support any recommendation that Ike might care to make with respect to Monty for not succeeding in going places with his big three-armored division push. There were reports from advanced recce units called Phantom late yesterday that the British tanks east and south of Khan hit an anti-tank screen that stopped them cold with heavy casualties, whereupon the tanks were held back and the Scots' 5th Brigade infantry given the lead. The loss of trained tank crews hurts the British badly as they already are moving heaven and earth for replacements. Monty had a press conference yesterday at which he said that at least 156,000 Germans had been killed or wounded since D-Day, yet in the big push east and south of Caen, only 2,500 prisoners were taken. Ike said yesterday that with 7,000 tons of bombs dropped in the most elaborate bombing of enemy front-line positions ever accomplished, only seven miles were gained. Can we afford a thousand tons of bombs per mile? The air people are completely disgusted with the lack of progress. My three years with Eisenhower, the personal diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, page 617. Goodwood ended on the 20th of July, when Hitler was supposed to be assassinated in his wolf's lair. But not only did Hitler survive, so did Rommel.